And in many ways, this deck carries on from what I just talked about, um, because I thought it was a very interesting way to reflect on you know, how is it we've arrived today at this microservices architecture and this approach, this cloud native approach. Because I think if you reflect on that and understand some of the need for that, it helps you talk about the future. Um, and you know, as the saying goes, you learn a lot from the past, from the, from the history, um, and that allows you to set your future direction. And that's why you know, it's very important to learn historical things so you don't make the same mistakes and understand where things are going. So this talk really is about the rise and reign of microservices and why it's become predominant today in terms of how we build these architectures and just a reflection of why it's happened. And ultimately, it really, although you may think of microservices you know, as a technology thing, but ultimately, it's actually about the business that drives it in the end. And businesses are complex, and they're getting more complex, and they have to solve complex problems. I mean, everything from security to tax systems to um, any number of different financial problems to healthcare to um, all sorts of different types of complex problems that emerge that we need to solve inside our society. So, and the expectations around these businesses is that consume, people want consumer grade experiences, they want them to be feature rich, secure, and reliant. And yet, businesses at the same time have increasing competition, uh, the need to deliver faster, uh, more complex technologies, choices around this all, um, and the complexity of their software is in increasing. So, these expectations on these complex business problems sort of drive basically how you think about what you need to build. So let's sort of touch on each one of those and see how it's reflected and um, you know, changed how we think about how we build software. And the first is delivery speed. And I, I draw this because you know, if you look back into the 80s, there was this wonderful world that still exists in some organizations of the, the waterfall. And this is where we created wonderful walls and partitions and there was a developer team that threw this thing over the wall to the test team, and they tested it all, and they threw it back again, and they threw it over the wall to the ops team, and then they threw it back again, and there was lots of partition wall throwing over, and everyone was in their little silos, and you know, how they ever got into that place in the first place is kind of beyond me, because we probably, I think it's just teams grow and everyone separates them out into different organizations. But you know, it worked, but it took weeks and months for things to come out. Um, and all organizations were like this. When I first turned up at Microsoft at the end of the 90s, you know, this was the classic model. They had dev teams, they had test teams, they had operational deployment teams, and you know, software shipped on a CD, and it took two years to get it out. Um, and then everyone decided, well, you know, we'll move to something called Agile, and we'll combine two of those teams, the test and the uh, dev team, but we'll still have this wall that we'll throw it over. But by then, you know, the cloud was also starting to emerge as a deploy model to speed things up. And I sort of took it down to sort of weeks and days. And then nowadays, really, you do get more to this sort of, you know, the, the modern era now that most companies are trying to strive towards is really where they, they are trying to focus on building a platform team within inside their company. There aren't these walls and divisions anymore. And that single team is one that's focused on working with an SRE team to build that typically runs on sort of some cloud technology because they need to get it down to hours or days. And a lot of this gets reflected in a very interesting report from um, McKinsey um, that they did a couple of years back or about a year and a half ago. And they looked across all of these different sort of characteristics, the organizational structure, the type of technologies used, uh, the working uh, behaviors of the different teams across all sorts of different industries. And basically they found that those that were more open to innovation, the more that had broken down these walls, the more of those teams that had taken on and adopted sort of these uh, faster engineering practices and, and, and organizationally had changed their organization to um, make sure that they could ship faster, were the ones that actually generated higher revenue um, and actually higher innovation around them all. So they happened to call this you know, the developer philosophy index, but basically it was a characteristic of how the company, the organization itself, had to ship faster and more frequently in order to make more revenue and be more successful. Moving on to kind of complexity. Um, so I, I love uh, reading about paleontology. Um, it's one of my, I love those sort of paleontology books. So I always like trying to go back to some characteristics. And I sort of love this kind of picture here where basically over time, you know, from you look at life on Earth, um, things have kind of 
Well, they took three billion years of not doing very much and then slowly kind of building up to multicellular animals. But then kind of about 500 million years ago, all of a sudden, you know, they figured out how to stitch together a multitude of things and starting to build more and more complex things. And, you know, then there was an explosion of very complex technology in the biological space. And that resulted in things like conscious humans that are aware of their own consciousness themselves. Um, but, you know, you created elephants and dinosaurs and birds and all sorts of crazy things um, who are very complex and very um, unique in their way. Um, but it took a while to figure out that technology. But, you know, that was a thing that became uh, a trend within there. Now, you know, we've only got a period of time left to kind of finish this all, another 500 million years. But it shows that, you know, complexity in the biological world, you know, happened pretty fast once they sort of figured it out. And if you look at software, you know, all sorts of software trends of complexity have happened over the years. Um, actually, it's quite hard finding graphs of complexity in software as a whole. But I happened to pull out a couple on the right here, which were the aviation the industry with Boeing and Airbus aircraft in the top right there, and military aircraft complexity. Um, and the one on the bottom right, which is in cars, shows that you know, the very first software in cars was basically you know, in the radio itself. And now, of course, cars are enormously complicated. In fact, you know, the average car has over 120 microcontrollers over it, nearly 3,000 different silicon chips inside it all. Um, and it basically is a distributed system on wheels. Um, they happen to have done a lot of embedded stuff inside them all. Um, and that really is sort of a distributed architecture to be able to communicate between these things. Um, and of course, the thing that they ran into is because they put a chip in place to simply, you know, heat your seat. And now, of course, you know, they have a supply chain issue. You know, it slowed down their whole growth. And so, you know, there's growth in the software complexity inside there, but there's also growth of change of architecture. You know, there's a driving need inside um, all the car industry that they have to consolidate all sorts of non-critical functionality into sort of Linux machines on their box. Because, you know, why do I need a single microcontroller chip for my seat warmer when I can put it as a piece of software and over the uh, update onto a single Linux box running inside there? Um, and so that change of architecture is dramatically affecting this whole car industry and what their expectations of people are inside their cars. But anyway, there's complexity happening inside there. And on top of all of this, of course, you also get technology choices that, you know, are just outstanding you know, and unbelievably, you know, um, complex today in terms of the number of choices you have. And as a developer, you know, the choice and pace of development of all the different type of technologies makes it really hard for you to keep up. I'm sure you're familiar with the picture on the right there if you're in CNCF. Um, and then a great place to look at sort of all the open source trends is inside this site, place called OSS Insight in terms of you see the trends of different types of open source technologies there. So if you put this all together and you say, well, I've got this need for speed development, I've got this increasing complexity, Ultimately, what it comes down to is you have to combine this with architecture. And this is really what happened, um, why you've evolved into this growing microservices and cloud-native development is because, you know, for a long time, we had the ability to kind of build sort of end-tier applications. Um, and it works very well, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's a perfectly valid architecture where you deploy a set of, you know, known larger processes across a set of machines. But just like the multicellular animals uh, into my evolution graph, it got to a point that it didn't work anymore. And if you were creating more complex software, you had to figure out and do something different. And so that's really where, you know, the microservices distributed systems architecture has come about, where, you know, I have smaller pieces of code that are versioned, that can be deployed, that can ship faster, that are more um, aligned with my business domains around these things that, uh, you know, can be represented across different types of storage and technologies around this thing and become more modular, and I can grow and expand that, and I can scale this all up. You know, this is why it's emerged inside that. And if you have that need, that's where you have to go to. Of course, if you don't have that need, you can stick inside you know, other architectures. But increasingly, you know, this is where the world is going. And I think that this reflects well, really, when you look at two very interesting surveys, um, both from O'Reilly. And they asked uh, a whole set of developers, about a couple of thousand of them, you know, what were the benefits they got from moving to this sort of architecture. And you can see here, you know, feature flexibility, responding quickly to changes, better overall scalability, more frequent code updates, you know, developer productivity around these all. Um, and those are the benefits you got. Now, it doesn't mean to say it's easy, but you have to think about the, when, given you think about the architecture understanding, those are the sort of benefits you can achieve from this. 
an even more interesting survey that came out earlier this year, which also reflected on the thousands of developers that O'Reilly sees, is that they asked them, you know, what are the most important trends that you see for you to learn? And the top three literally were architecture, Kubernetes, microservices together. Um, and that kind of basically reflects on the growing need for you know, the developer community as a whole to kind of embrace this sort of approach. And so it's become, pretty much become standard and uh, the de facto way of doing this. And, and I think they made a comment in there that was very interesting and that is success with microservices is impossible without giving serious thought to the design of good APIs and how they present you know, those between your services to each other. Um, and so that really comes down to the fact that, you know, yes, there is increasing, well, the complexity you have to deal with, but the complexity comes from the business side of these things. And so, you know, don't confuse the complexity of your software. If your business problem is simple, you're just over-engineering it, so don't. <laughs> so engineer it correctly around those things. You know, you don't have to make it complicated. Your business, uh, your business should be complicated and reflected through that. So Microsoft's services do represent this trade-off between complexity and flexibility, but the choices you make from architecture are very important about how you do that. So this comes to a kind of, you know, where a little bit of a, you know, kind of a summary conclusion around this. Um, and that really what is, is, well, how do you deal with this? And really, it's about abstractions. Um, and you may recognize here that cells did a very interesting thing in biology where they stuck a little receptor out of them all and said, there's my API, deal with it so you don't have to see all the complexity inside my cell. Well, you know, effectively, we've done the same things ourselves inside uh, um, the, uh, our software and inside the technology industries itself to create APIs across a realm of different types of different types of businesses. And I think this reflection today that whether you're doing security software or whether you're doing streaming, uh, sh shipping software or whether you're doing communication software, you know, the world is converging around producing APIs that allow developers to be productive about stitching together and building their overall application. And so we're very much in an API-driven world of, of abstractions around these things. But of course, you know, underneath building all these APIs, you have to think about your architecture of how they scale, um, and that's where you know, the microservices approach for building those scalable distributed applications comes about. So for me, you know, the continued direction around these is that that design approach of how you build these distributed applications is here to stay. It's the de facto way that's going to happen. It'll get refined a little bit more. The may, name may change a little bit more. But in the end, you know, it's about you know, how we deal with producing this more increasingly complex, scalable, um, and uh, feature-rich systems that we have to deploy on a very fast and regular basis. And it'll still be driven by domain-driven design of the business itself, understanding its problem. But Increasingly, what will happen, I see, is that there'll be a lot more democratization of building these internal developer platforms that before were the prelude of very well-funded companies, that more and more companies will be able to achieve that themselves. And I think Dapper's particular role inside all of this that's very strong is that you know, it provides this abstraction and its help for you as a developer over the complexity of how you build and run those services. So the API abstractions that Dapper provides over you know, whether it's secret management or services of its invocation or those other things help you become productive as a developer themselves and the sort of the standardization across those APIs. So hopefully we can come to an agreement across those and then effectively you know, we can start to spend, spend focus, focus more of your time on developing the business applications. I think interestingly another important trend that I see as well is not only the developer API focus but also the description of the application model itself, how the applications themselves fit and work together, how you just like describe the relationships. And I think there's a very interesting project there called Acorn that allows you to describe application deployments, the relationships between themselves. Um, and if you ever looked at the cross-plane project, they have a similar thing inside there. And I think those combined will sort of set a direction for microservices as a whole um, as we continue to evolve this um, and effectively allow us to build this sort of API-driven um, software culture inside. So with that, I'm going to say thank you.